I think we can crack on. So great. Well, welcome again. Um, just to say, you know, so this is the agenda we want to talk to you. You know, why value investing? I think that's quite an important point to discuss. Why ran more and why now? And then leave lots of time for Q&A. There's, uh, there's lots going on out there in the world and we want to make ourselves available. And with me today is Andrew, Andrew Lapping, who's a critical part of our team. Um, and Andrew has been with us for just over a year or so. Um, and as part of our research team, we've got... Um, we, we've got another few analysts as well um, who are also attending the call. Good. So is now the time to be a value investor? That was the question I posed when we put this presentation together. And the answer is quite simply, yes, it always is. You know, and here you can just see, I mean, everybody wants a good deal. Who doesn't want a good deal? Whether you're buying a car, or whether you're buying a holiday, whether you're buying clothes, you want a good deal. And it's not to say that just because there's a deal going, you buying a rust bucket, you can still be getting a BMW or going to a nice holiday destination or buying high quality clothes. You're just buying them at the right time. And what that means is your money goes further and who doesn't want their money to go further, okay? Um, and, and I guess a simple analogy is if, if you wanna buy a BMW convertible, are you gonna get a great price if you buy it on a Saturday morning on a beautiful day at the beginning of summer? Or are you going to get a better price if you buy it on Tuesday evening on a rainy day, you know, in winter? The difference is you're going to have to, of course, you're going to get a better price close to quarter end in winter if you're buying a convertible. Um, the difference is you'd have to wait six months until the summer. But you're still buying a quality car. And I think that's the point that often gets blurred when people think of, of, of value. And just to take this point a little further, what you've got here is a scatter plot. And it's S&P 500, it's monthly data points since 1972. And you've got the price to earnings ratio on the X axis and the subsequent three year per annum return on the Y axis. So each dot represents what was the PE at the time and what was the subsequent three year return. And what you'll notice is that when the PEs are lower, all right, you, you don't suffer the loss. Whereas if the PE is higher, let's say it's above between 15 and 20 in this, uh, over this period, you know, at times the return was negative, at times the return was positive. So it's not all about the P. It's obviously, you know, th there's lots of other factors that come into play. And also, if the PE was very high, well, then you suffered a negative return. So that's really the message that it doesn't, that, that um, it's all about your, your downside. And that's particularly important. Now, just to run through a quick, um, a quick bit of history as to how we got here, you know, why has value been value investing being out of favor. And this is data going back to 1975. It's the relative line of world value versus the world index. And when the line is sloping up, values outperformed. And you can see that since 1975 up until you know, uh, mid-2007, value outperformed, apart from a few periods when you had the 87 crash, it, it underperformed leading into the crash, and it underperformed leading into the tech bubble. And what you saw afterwards was a sharp rebound. OK, um, but then when it peaked, after it peaked, you can see that value has underperformed. But what changed up here and more recently value has been outperforming and what changed here? And so let's take a look. Well, the first thing is back in September 2008, we had the global financial crisis. And this is just some headlines of the, uh, the, the journals at the time. Grave financial threats, a sweeping plan to fight the crisis. And so the Fed launched this massive um, quantitative easing to fight the crisis. And what you've got here is that same chart that I showed you with the relatives. And in the chart below, the green shaded block is the Fed's assets, all right? And that's in trillions of dollars. That's what the Fed's balance sheet looks like. And the, the orange line is the Fed funds rate. And you can see that from the peak in 2007, when they unleashed this massive quantitative easing to stimulate things and to keep it going, and they bought bonds, um, assets grew massively. And they also lowered interest rates from around 5% then to pretty much naught for a protracted period. And then they started raising them, and then you had it, the pandemic, and they lowered them again to, um, to stimulate it further. And that correlates you know, quite nicely with the underperformance. Okay, so we need to bear in mind that this underperformance took place in an environment of quantitative easing, which lowered interest rates, 
And what that does is it lowers the discount rates of, of growing companies. They could lower interest rates because we were in an environment of low inflation. And we were in an environment of low inflation because we had global stability and factories could move production offshore to places like China. And so you had offshoring. But what's very important and a point that people often miss is that we're in a complete opposite environment. We now have global instability, and that means that production is now being onshored. And we all just figured out that it was no good having 90% of our protective equipment manufactured in China at a time when you had supply chain problems. And so there's onshoring going on, which is leading to high inflation, which is causing the Fed to tail back on the quantitative tightening. And you can see that the assets have just started dipping and rising interest rates. So it's the complete opposite. And if it's the complete opposite of a time when value underperformed, shouldn't you expect value to outperform? And that, I guess, is quite a key point that you'd like to, to leave with, with people. All right. And, and because interest rates were, were practically zero, and at, at a time zero, it, it led to a re-rating of bond proxies. If you were getting a zero percent, you know, no return on your bonds, and here were these companies paying two and three percent dividends, that was fairly attractive. And so what you've got here is this is the, um, the share price, both the share price and the forward earnings have been rebased to 100. So this is Procter & Gamble, and you can see that for Procter & Gamble, earnings per share Forward earnings per share went from 100 to 150. That's only 4% growth per annum over the 10-year period. Okay, we've just taken 10 years, um, going back 10 years from today. But the share price went from 100 to 325. So you saw a massive re-rating, and part of that was because of the attractiveness of uh, the dividends at a time when your yields were, were practically zero. And you also saw a re-rating of growing companies. Because interest rates were zero, it meant $100 of earnings that we thought we were going to earn in 10 years time are pretty much worth $100 now. Um, when inflation kicks in and you're dis using a higher discount rate, that's no, not the case. And so in the case of Microsoft, which has grown earnings um, admirably over the last 10 years, earnings, forward earnings have gone from 100 to just over 300. So it's about 15% per year. But the share price is up tenfold. Okay, and this so you've had a detachment of um, of the share price to uh, to earnings, and that's happened at a time when ETF inflows poured in. I mean, here you can see that back in two thousand and nine, only a trillion dollars in ETFs, and in two thousand and twenty one, ten trillion dollars, up tenfold. Now. If the ETF assets are pouring in and it's going to the S&P 500s, uh, you know, and, and the largest constituents of those are the likes of Microsoft and Apple, what is that doing? That's pushing those share prices further, which means makes them bigger in the index, which means when there's more ETF flows, they get a bigger share of the pie. Um, and so you can see a tripling of assets in the last few years. Okay, and as, as we've said before, you know, it, it was simple because the, the obvious thing is, well, all these companies, are uh, the share prices are detaching themselves from earnings. And so fund managers who are looking on a bottom up basis going, well, I'm not paying for this. You know, all of a sudden, as indices are beating asset managers. And so it became simple. Pour money into ETFs because you're getting a benchmark return. The benchmark's going up and and the, the fees are low. Of course, you know, we've seen what's happened this year. All right, and this produced very concentrated performance. So what I've got here is the index weighting in the MSCI World Index of these seven companies um, back in 2012. And you can see Apple 2%, Microsoft less than one. Now this is far more diversified than the S&P 500. This is the World Index. But let's roll forward to now. And those same seven companies are no longer 4% of the index. They're now 15% of the index, just under 15%. Of course, you would, would have wanted Apple to have 2% of Apple back then. <clears throat> the question is whether you want 5% of your money in Apple today and 3.5% in Microsoft, et cetera. So, you know, if you look at the percentage of returns, so the index, the world index doubled over this period. And these seven companies, which comprise only 0.2% of the constituents of the world index, have comprised 25% of the return. OK, um, and Apple alone is worth 10 percent. So so and the other 2,501 companies, you know, the rest of the return, but incredibly concentrated return. And so um, the question is, can this be repeated from this point? Well, we've shown you what um, 
what those prices have done relative to earnings. OK, unfortunately, that period of quantitative easing of low interest rates of low inflation is over. And the Fed is now quantitative tightening. And it's going to on an unprecedented scale. And this was back in June. And another article from the Financial Times warns US rates will peak at a higher level. They are on a mission to curb this inflation. They've got to unwind the balance sheet. And you can see that was just a few days ago. All right. And the problem is when highly rated companies forecasts falter, share prices all of a sudden go back to reality. OK, we know that earnings drive share price. And this is an example of PayPal, you know, where it just became detached and the growth was accelerating and everybody thought the growth was going to go on forever. Now, what's important is that PayPal didn't suddenly start making losses. That just meant that the growth was slightly less than people were expecting. And all of a sudden, reality bites and you get a some 70, 80 percent collapse in the share price. OK, um, so that's so that's a little bit of a backdrop. But why ran more? I mean, why? You know, why why us? Well, we'd like to think we invest like astute business people. You know, we um, we just want to buy decent businesses with great cash flow. We're not look out there looking to buy low quality companies. We all want high quality companies. We all want growing companies. We've seen we understand that growing earnings um, translates through to growing share prices over the long term, but we're not going to pay too much for them. So we want decent businesses with great cash flow and we want management to be on our side. It's not good enough to just have good management. You could argue that Elon Musk is a good manager. Well, he has, you know, with the amazing stuff he's done with Tesla. But is he on your side? Um, are management teams on your side if they're taking too much in the form of own remuneration, in the form of share options, et cetera? So we want management to be on our side and to be making sensible capital allocation decisions. And we need the share price to be mispriced. <coughs> Excuse me. Because it is only when a share price is mispriced that it offers valuation upside. If there are 54 analysts who all think Microsoft's a buy, is it likely to be mispriced? And, and by being mispriced, it gives you a margin of safety. Now, it's only mispriced with a reason. And in many cases, the reasons are valid. And so that's what me and the team, you know, that's what we do is to try and assess whether we think that those reasons are valid. And it's when it's mispriced and it's a short term uh, reason that we think is going to, uh, you know, it's going to make way in time where we get the opportunity and we like to speak to the truth you know most importantly to ourselves we are not going to get every investment call right okay we are going to get six or seven out of ten right and three we're going to get wrong but the three that you get wrong we can't lose too much money and that's what is important we don't want a paypal we don't want a meta on our hands and the important thing is um is the margin of safety gives you some downside protection for the situations where you get wrong and we're going to ignore the benchmark just because you know, Apple is the biggest company in the benchmark benchmark. That doesn't necessarily mean Apple offers great value. And so we might not own it. Um, so we 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 are only interested in companies that offer valuation upside with all of those criteria, regardless of the weighting in the benchmark. And that means we can go around the world. The luxury we have as global investors is we can find opportunities in in all regions. Um, and certainly right now we're finding some regions more attractive than others. And then I guess the other thing is our performance. And, and this is uh, to the end of November. This is the Morningstar chart and it shows us. So year to date, we're up 1.6% in dollars. And, and actually, you know, that includes our Russian stocks. We took a hit in Russia and that's those have all been written down to zero. Um, and that is meaningfully ahead of the world index and our peers. And over you can, and you, so Morningstar rank us in the first percentile of peer groups. And you can see over one and two years, first percentile, three years, top quartile. Um, and since inception, the eighth percentile. So, you know, we've been around the block, we've done, we've done our time. And what's interesting when you reflect on this chart is we've had recessions in the past, 2008. We had the 2011 European crisis, Fukushima, record high interest rate, uh, high oil price. Um, we've had the pandemic, and yet we've managed to compound at nine and a half percent after fees. Um, and so, you know, we, we uh, our process works. And so just to talk a little bit about some examples of companies that we've got. And so the first one just to talk about um, is, is Associated British Foods. And Associated British Foods is a, a conglomerate and 50% of the, the shares are held by the Western family. And we think they are um, impressive stewards of capital. It's, um, it's a little like a Berkshire Hathaway where they have some cash cows 
um, that generate lots of, of cash, and then they invest that cash in growing companies. And so there's a, a, a mix, and about 50% of the business is Primark. So for our any South African um, uh, people who are attending, that's like a it's like a Mr. Price. Okay, it is low cost clothing and uh, and and very 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 good prices, um, which we think is you know is recession proof because people will be trading down to that and it offers great value. Interestingly, they don't do online shopping, and so when the pandemic hit. And they had stores only. And the reason they don't do online shopping is because it's expensive, because of returns. Um, you know, if you buy an article of clothing and you send it back, the returns are about six times more expensive than, than the cost of fulfilling the original order. Um, and so Primark, you can see the share price here, the blue line is, and then what we've got on the green line is core free ca core cash flow, which is cash flow minus working capital. And the reason we took that out in this example is just because of the pandemic and supply chains messing it up with um, in, in recent periods. But the market got very excited about the growth opportunities of Primark. And, and that was back in 2013, 14. And, um, and then the growth slowed and all of a sudden you had a PayPal situation where reality bites and it, and it pulls back. But what you also have within Associated British Foods is Twining's Tea and Ilovo Sugar and a huge con, um, groceries business as well. But but why was it mispriced? Well, it was mispriced recently, A, because of the pandemic and the concern over online shopping that just started click and collect. Um, and also we've had quite a lot of turmoil here in the UK. We've had rising mortgage rates. We've had political uncertainty. Um, we've had uh, slow economic growth with, with COVID, et cetera. And so Investors over here didn't want to own UK retail, but but Associated British Foods is not only UK retail. And so that kind of thing gives you the opportunity where the perception is wrong that you've got a big stable business generating lots of cash flow, the growth opportunity hasn't gone away, and actually they're well positioned on the retail side. And so um, and we could buy this company at 10% free cash flow yield. All right. And more recently, what they've done, you'll see the little blue line has bounced. They they announced their results. Um, they've got a very strong balance sheet with net cash if you exclude lease liabilities, and they've started buying back stock. And that's exactly the kind of action that we like because we, and demonstrates management team who um, who's on our side buying back the shares at an attractive price. Another example is AIB. Now AIB is the second largest bank in Ireland, you know, Allied Irish, and. And banks have been getting a bad rap in recent years, and you'll hear many and um, fund managers say, "No, they don't like banks; they're terrible businesses." Well, they have been very difficult businesses when you're running when interest rates globally have been running at close to zero. You know, it's hard to make it's hard to make a buck as a bank. But actually, now interest rates are, are, have started rising. It's a different story. And just to look at Ireland, I mean, Ireland is enjoying employment at all-time highs. They're borrowing in real terms at multi-decade lows, and the economy is forecast to grow. It's a it's a Brexit beneficiary. It's the only country left in the European Union that, with English as its uh, as its primary language. And so, if you're an international operation and you want access to the European Union, but you you know you, you're you're from an English-speaking country, you're probably going to establish yourself in in Ireland. And so, the Irish economy has actually been growing. And here you've got um, an uncompetitive market, really, because in recent years, some of the other banks have left. And so there's, there's really only three players left in Ireland. And it's extremely well capitalized. Their core capital ratio is 15%, which is high. And this is a comment from, uh, from the management team the other day in a presentation. They said the group is in the strongest position in decades. You can see the date, the 2nd of the 12th. OK, and it's trading at 0.6 times tangible book value. Why is that? Why is it mispriced? Well, it's a European company who wants to own Europe. They've got a war. OK, but, but this economy is doing well um, and uh, and the perception of banks, etc. So it's another example of a company that we think um, perception is misplaced. And the third company to tell you about is Mizuno. Now, for the golfers out there, Mizuno is very well known in in golf, but it also is. Um, is a is a meaningful player, especially in Japan and many other sports. So interesting to know the most popular sport in Japan is baseball, and Mizuno is occupies a good position in in baseball. In fact, they had 15 players in the World Cup playing with their football boots. 
Um, they are, you know, so, so you've got golf, you've got baseball, um, hockey, running. For the runners out there, you'll know Mizuno shoes are, are very popular in running. And, and what's happened is after COVID, you saw a resurgence in golf. And so in the last trailing 12 months, Mizuno's revenue is up 10%. In fact, it's up 25% if you look at just the last quarter. And earnings are up 19%. So here you've got this well-known brand that has been ignored, that suffered because golf was, was you know, gave way to mountain biking, I guess, in many, in many parts. Um, but now you've seen the resurgence in golf. They've got their new balls launching. They've got 30% of the market cap in cash, and it's on seven times earnings. Okay, so compare that to Nike with 37 times earnings, and Nike wish it, wished that it had grew, grown revenue 10% over the last um, trailing 12 months. So we're excited about Mizuno. Um, and again, it's a cheap company, but things are going well and they're growing. And uh, as you know, we like growing um, share prices. Now, the advantage, and this is an important slide, the advantage of being a small fund is that we can take we can take advantage of these opportunities. So just, just explain this chart. So the first company, Associated British Foods, we've got a 4.5% position. Its market cap is a 13 billion pound, it's a 13 billion pound company. The problem is the Western family owns half of it. And so if you look at the value of trade on their shares on a daily basis, it's around 16 million pounds. Now, you definitely don't want to be more than 10% of the daily trade. So if you want to buy shares, don't go out there and try and buy them all in one go, because with the modern day with algorithms and all the rest, they will sniff out that there's a big and aggressive buyer. And so if you only want to participate in 10% of the daily trade, that means you can buy 1.6 million pounds worth of um, associated British foods a day. Now, for a small fund like us, that's one and a half days. Okay, we've got opposition, and we would have taken more than one and a half days to acquire opposition to make sure that you get a good price. But if you're a $20 billion fund and you want a 2% position, that means you need to have a $400 million position. Okay, it's going to take you 208 days. For AIB Group, it's two point, and so you're probably not going to do it. And in many companies, many large fund managers, they have, um, they won't trade, and they won't be interested in. They don't care how big the company is, but if there's not a certain amount of the daily average daily trade, they won't participate, regardless of how exciting that company is as an investment opportunity. Let's look at AIB Group. Similar thing. It's an eight billion euro company. It's not an insignificant size company, um, but it only trades 12 million euros a day. And that means it'd take us one and a half days. Um, but now this is euros, not dollars, et cetera. And, uh, and so that'll take more days for um, yes, nearly a year. You'd be on the bid for a big company for nearly a year to buy AIB. And what about Mizuno? Well, Mizuno is only a $570 million company with 30% of the market cap in cash. And they only trade one and a half million dollars a day, which is 140,000. And so it'll take us a week, just over a week to buy. Okay, but if you're a, you can't actually buy um, a 2% position because you don't own all of the company. And so that is really important, especially now in this environment where you've seen ETFs push the values of these large mega caps to points where they no longer op offer opportunities and great return potential, um, and we can take advantage of those. And I wrote in our latest fact sheet of Halfords, and that's another example of that. Okay, let's contrast that with Microsoft. A $1.9 trillion company trades $7.5 billion a day 10% of that, 750 million dollars, and guess what? The large funds will just—they'll just stay around and stick around with Microsoft because they can get that position. Um, and uh, even if Microsoft doesn't really offer, you know, ignore enormous upside. And so that's 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 an important point. So our regional weights are very different because I mentioned that we don't we don't care about the benchmark. We don't find opportunities in North America. You know, and it's unsurprising. That's where everybody's invested. It's over 70% of the index. We're less than 20% in North America. We have nothing against North American companies. We've nothing against. We've owned Microsoft in the past. We've owned Google um, in the past. In 2014, NVIDIA was one of our biggest positions. 2017, Google was, or Alphabet was one of our largest positions. But we don't find them attractive now. Um, we find European companies very attractive. And of course, you know, people can make these throwaway comments, oh, Europe's a basket case. It's, it's not. There are some fantastic companies in Europe and they're being ignored. And great, we will find, we'll hoover up those opportunities. And we also find Japan very exciting. 
you know, especially with this weak yen and you don't have um, wage inflation in Japan and they're well-managed companies that don't overpay their executives, we find Japan very exciting. Um, and, uh, and, and emerging markets as well. So if you look through the weighted average earnings multiple of the fund, it's just under seven. Uh, you know, it's half the value of the world index on a price to book 0.7 um, versus 2.8 dividend yield. If we paid out all our dividends, I mean, we don't have a distribution class at the moment. That, that would be the gross yield which is meaningfully um, more than the world index. And you can see the, the weighted average, it's a bit of a, you know, it can get skewed based on the size of the companies. Um, but it just, what this highlights is how concentrated the world index is in the large companies. I think I'm right in saying the top 20 companies in the world index make up about a quarter of, and that's, you know, in nearly 2000 companies make up a quarter of the market cap of the world index. Um, we, we're in the smaller zone, but these are not micro caps. These are meaningfully sized companies. Nine billion is about the weighted average at the moment. All right. So why now? I've dealt with why value investing, why ran more, but why now? Well, here is that same chart that I showed you earlier of the large cap USA. OK, and it helps, helps explain why we don't find opportunities in the USA, where the earnings have gone from 100 to 200, but the share price has gone from 100 to 300. OK, uh, remember PayPal? Here's the IT it's gone from 100 to 250, and you can see it's topping out. OK, so that's what worries us about uh, the, the IT companies. But the important point is not because they're expensive, it's because they've actually stopped growing. And operating income growth of large tech has actually gone negative. And this is, if you add what, so let's have a look at this. This is trailing 12 month revenue growth. That's the blue bars, trailing 12 month operating income. And you can see when revenue is growing and you're growing your costs slower, well, your margin expands. So your revenue, um, you know, your operating income will grow faster than your revenue. And that's what happened in the pandemic. All of a sudden, everyone's sitting at home, ordering stuff online, buying new iPads and iPhones. Um, and you can see revenue, the blue bars growing, but the operating leverage came through and you saw the, the operating income growth much faster. Um, then what happened is all these companies thought this was going to happen forever, invested, took on more staff, et cetera, and the opposite has happened. So revenue growth has now started slowing. But because of taking on more expenses, you can see that the operating income growth has actually been falling. And last quarter, went negative. Okay, so many of these companies, I mean, it's interesting that we now in the Christmas holiday season with Thanksgiving and Christmas, Amazon said they're not going to make any money this quarter. And this is a retailer. Um, and that's with their their cloud business. And so the, the, all these companies, you know, in the past, Amazon had the cloud, and Google had the advertising and Microsoft had enterprise, but they've all moved into each other's zones to try and, and get what growth is left. So now Google's in cloud and Microsoft's in cloud and Apple's moved into advertising and you know Amazon's moved into advertising. And so you now got lots more players in the advertising market at a time when advertisers are cutting budgets. And so it shouldn't surprise anybody that operating income growth has gone negative. And yet the bulk of the world's investments are still in these companies at high prices. Okay. And, um, and so that's what we think is concerning. Now look at the MSCI world small cap. This is the same chart. Earnings have also gone to 200, but the share prices haven't detached. They're not up here. And that's why it's not surprising that we find more opportunities in, in the smaller companies. And you can see that this is the, the PE relative. So when the PE relative is one, the, the PE of the small cap index is the same as the PE of the large cap index, but there's a 30% discount at the moment. Um, and so that's where we, that's our happy hunting ground. But what about a recession? Everybody is concerned about a recession. And here's a, and, and please Google and have a look at the correlation of recessions and, and stock market um, returns, and you'll find it's, it's pretty much non-existent. Um, and this is some research from Northern Trust, and they did real GDP by year and real return by year. And, and what they found is there's not much, there's like pretty much no, no correlation. What they then did is they then looked ahead and said, okay, well, what about, um, what about if, if you could have had perfect foresight? And there was a marginal correlation, but what it actually meant was that it was already in the price. Okay, and so by the time you see the word recession all over the front pages of the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Trust me, it's in the price. OK, 
Okay. Um, and here's an example in the Bank of America, they do a fund manager survey every month and they found that 95% of investors expect there to be a recession in Europe. 95%. It's the highest level since the height of the financial crisis in 2008. There was an article the other day in the um, in the Financial Times from the a German um, institute, industry institute, and they said we were actually too we were too negative, and we're probably going to raise our our guidance. But when we see recession, and we see this kind of extent, 95% expecting the recession, we just see opportunities because we know that it's in the price. And if you think about it. It's you can't you can't really lose because if there's no recession, well, you've bought at a great price. If there is a recession, well, it's already in the price. Um, and uh, and so that's how, you know, and, and also if you look at how negative U UK, just to use a recent example, how negative the sentiment was in the UK, it still didn't stop us from making 45 percent return from health in a couple of months in dollars. OK, so whenever we see these negative comments, it just means that people are throwing the baby out of the bathwater and we can find those kinds of opportunities. So, so really that's the, you know, why ran what we've managed to deliver top quartile returns of the long term. We're well positioned to capitalize on smaller companies. Your margin of safety in the current environment, we think is quite crucial and we well positioned that. We have high active share. So you're getting something that you're not getting from passives and from any other fund managers. We don't charge performance fees, so we have a industry. We have a strategy tailwind. It means we're not going to take, and let's say value carries on doing well, we're not going to be taking um, returns based on that, our fees based on that. Um, and as we grow, we are we will reduce our fees. It's all uh, you've seen our pledge and our prospectus is being updated to account for that. Um, so we pass on the benefits to clients, but but opportunities created by fear are perishable. And um, and so, you know, that's why we're quite excited uh, right now um, with all the, the negative, because this war is not going to go on forever. Natural gas prices are not going to stay high forever, et cetera. And we will take advantage of those opportunities. So that really brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, just to, again, highlight, if you've got any questions and your Q&A is not working, um, because I know it depends on whether you, you, you logged in via the web or you logged in via the app, um, please do send questions to client services at ranmorefunds.com. And then just, uh, you know, in terms of how to invest, if that's of any interest, we're available on in these platforms locally in South Africa and internationally. Um, and there is a how to invest on our website in um, ranmorefunds.com. All right. So let me just go and see if there are any questions. Andrew, was there anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I mean, do you have any if you want an investor, what kind of question is that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny because actually something really got me thinking that one slide you showed of the seven biggest contributors to the world index growth and the 2,500 stocks in the world index. I actually just, and it got me thinking of what drives people investment decision. So our investment decision is driven by the cheapest stocks we can find. Okay, risk adjusted. But I just actually ran some numbers, and my stats might be wrong. It's a long time since I did stats at university. But the probability of you having one of those big seven stocks in your top 10, if you just buy World Index stocks, so the probability of having one of those World Index, those big seven stocks out of 2,500 in your top 10, just having one of them is only a 2.7% position probability. So if you just, if people start, Show stocks randomly based on value, only one out of 30 fund managers would have one of those top seven stocks in their top 10. Actually, it's much more than that, which makes me thinking actually a lot of those people are not driven by the cheapest stocks available. They're driven by the biggest stocks available. And the other point, which is very important, is an important thing about generating returns is not losing money. OK. Um, Yes, we lost money in Russia, but we may get it back. It's a different story. But buying expensive stocks like an overvalued PayPal, it's going to be very hard for those people to get their money back if you bought at the highs. And it's something we avoid, like the plague, is buying stocks who are very overvalued that you might never get your money back. Um, I think those were two of my takeaways, but yeah, it's interesting. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Right, some very good questions coming through. 
if so few people or funds can actually trade these stocks and only small amounts are traded, is it not a real liquidity risk? Well, you see, it's only a liquidity challenge if you're a large fund. And, and just to address that question, you know, if you've got management who are on your side and are making sensible decisions, I mean, as I mentioned, first of all, these, some of these, you know, these companies are, um, they are large companies. I mean, 13 billion pounds is a big company. Um, and, and the daily trade is quite a meaningful amount. I mean, 16 million. It's just insignificant if you are a massive fund. Um, but if you've got companies who and management are on your side and you've got strong balance sheets, well, they can take advantage of the liquidity. You've got private equity out there, and we've got a list of companies that have been taken private um, that we've owned at the time. Uh, they've got cash on the hip and they can take it private. You wake up all of a sudden and it's 30%. So, you know, we, we, we don't want to be in any positions where we can't get out of because we know we're not going to get everything right. Um, so we don't think it's – so we will – there's no ways we're going to be in a position where – um, the company is so small and the trade is so illiquid that we can't remedy it if we get it wrong. So we don't actually see liquidity risk at all. We manage that very closely. But I suppose the other side of that question is, oh, no, there's no one to buy it from you. Well, we actually don't really care because we're not playing the greater fool theory. We don't need some crazy to come and pay a silly price for our stocks. If Mizuno carries on growing and carries on trading with 7PE for the next 10 years, we hold it for the next 10 years, that's fantastic. We'll make a fantastic return just out of dividends and the company growing. We don't need huge re-ratings from our stocks to make returns. So, yeah. yeah. So, so we don't, yeah, we don't think it's a risk. You, you previously spoke about losing money in Russia. What is the situation while investment there? Well, we, um, we owned the GDRs, and they were in the process of being converted over to the underlying Russian equities. Now, we can't sell those for two reasons. One, Putin has said foreigners can't sell shares in, um, in sensitive Russian countries right, in the companies right now. Okay? And the second reason is just caught up in sanctions. But this war is not going to go on forever. And if we, could market, if we could sell those Russian equities now, based on the prices that are trading in Moscow, so it's very theoretical, all right, there would be another 11% of the fund. Okay, so the fund would go up 11%. Now, at some point, that all that highlights is there is some value there. We think there's some value there. Um, and we're just going to have to be patient. And that value will to accrue to people who are investors of the fund at that point in time. So hopefully that answers there. Surely there are opportunities in tech, given the underperformance of things like PayPal and Meta. Well, you see, the problem is just because something falls doesn't necessarily mean it's going back up. I mean, especially if it was just wildly overpriced. And, uh, and just to look at those companies like PayPal, I mean, think about how much money has been poured into fintech. Let's talk about PayPal originally, uh, initially and go and have a look on some of my LinkedIn comments of the comments I'd made about um, PayPal and their free cash flow, et cetera. Um, you, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the, the company, but it's a hugely competitive space. You've got Visa and MasterCard and PayPal and every single media company is out there trying to make work out how to make some money out of um, how to, out of fintech. And so the problem is when a lot of money moves into a space, that generally means that returns are going to be low. And, and you saw crazy things like PayPal buying buy now, pay later companies, okay? Um, and what is a buy now, pay later company? I mean, it's basically unsecured debt. We've seen the CFO leave from PayPal. Now, if he really thought it was, and he went to Walmart. If he really thought it was the most exciting place on earth, he was going to make a fortune with all his share options, really, would, they really have, would he really have resigned after, the, you know, the company was down some 75%? So, you know, so that's PayPal. What about something like Meta? Well, the problem is Meta has been locked out of the of the information that they get from from Apple and from Google um, about what the users you know like, and so the challenge is that's less attractive from an advertising perspective. Now, the, I mentioned that you've got a lot of companies who've moved into the advertising space um, that weren't in advertising before, and if you just think more recently, we've now got Netflix starting an advertising tier, and we've got Disney Plus doing an advertising tier. So if you're an advertiser, you've got lots of choices these days as to how to spend your money. Um, and, uh, and so we don't think that those companies are attractive. 
and we will, you know, look at the, I mean, Pape and uh, Meta are open about the changing landscape with what's going on in TikTok. If you look at Google, the changing things with shorts, Google YouTube shorts. Um, and so now you've got YouTube shorts and you've got TikTok and you've got Meta Reels. They're all competing for the same space. So it's incredibly competitive and everybody's watching them and they're still worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay, so we'll have to see. And I think, uh, you know, the strong dollar that we've seen in recent uh, months, that's still continuing. Um, Andrew, was anything you wanted to add there? Uh, I mean, just at that point you make on competition is absolutely crucial. Companies don't operate in a, in a vacuum. You addressed it with payments, but actually one of the biggest risks to these large companies' profits is competition in cloud. So Amazon and Microsoft currently make a great deal of money in Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. Google wants to get in on that, and Oracle, fine enough, also wants to get in on that a big way. So yeah, you have you see increasing extreme competition in that space. And when that happens and people are going to throw a vast amount of capital at something, it's very unusual to, for profits to go up. So, you know, the, the competition matters and you don't want to be in a sector where vast amounts of capital is being thrown at it because returns usually fall. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. All right, another good question. Outside Russia, can you speak to some of the stocks you've got wrong, lost money on in the last year? I mean, as I mentioned, we're not going to get them all right. And the key thing is the ones you get wrong, don't lose too much money. I mean, one example that springs to mind is Sally Beauty. And Sally Beauty have got a, a chain of um, of hair care salons in the States. And, you know, we liked annuity income. It um, they 70% of their products that they sold were sourced locally, so they didn't have supply chain challenges. It was very attractive. Management were buying back stock. We liked that. Um, but the but the revenue growth was sub inflation, and so we looked at this and thought, oh, we don't actually, you know, this is not the best use of our money. There's lots of other opportunities that we think um, offer better value, and and so we sold, we exited Sally Beauty, and you know, from start to finish, we probably lost I don't know 15 percent or so on a two three percent position. You're looking at sort of 30 bips. Um, so you know, is what it cost us. So that is the kind of example. It wasn't a disaster. It wasn't a, cal a calamity. We lost 70% of our money. And that's the, I think, the advantage of value investing is if you're not going to get it right, don't lose too much money. And you've got, we had some downside. They stopped buying back stock. Revenue was um, not growing as fast, which meant that you then had, you had cost inflation. So their margins were getting squeezed, but they weren't losing money. Um, yeah, so that's an example of, of a company we got wrong. And, and we like to be open and honest and say, well, hang on, if we, you know, if, if we get it wrong and, and our team, when we say to our analysts as well, you know, we don't care where we bought the price. It's like it, it, today would be buy it today. And if we're not going to buy it today and we think things have changed, then we must, we must move on. The other one, Sean, that we're probably down on, we're probably down on some of the European banks because um, we own position of European banks. Uh, when the Russian invasion happened, those things halved um, and they've recovered. And they're actually, rather than exiting, we've probably increased our weighting because we thought the outlook was still decent. Um, and we actually upped the position um, or bought more stock. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, example, yeah, SOC Gen, because of their Russian, uh, they had a position in Russia. Um, all right. Let's have a look here. Um, do you think there will be more value in the U.S. markets? Let me just, sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing here. Do you think there'll be more value in the U.S. markets next year once consumers have felt the effect of the rate hikes? Companies missing earnings and prices dropping. Uh, it's going to be challenging, I think. It's going to, you know, these, the, the, the wind has been at the U.S. back for a long, long time. And, and these things are not normally over in a short space of time. And, um, you know, I read on the headlines this morning, Pepsi is now cutting um, cutting numbers, cutting staff numbers. We've seen that a lot of these U.S. companies are now retrenching people, and this is not something that they're used to. You know, they've been in the mode of hiring people. Um, we've now got mortgage rates in the U.S. are seven percent. Mortgage rates in Europe are two. You know, if I wanted to, if I had to spend a recession somewhere, I would definitely spend it in Europe. You know, if I was because I've got free health care, which I don't have in the U.S., I've got a government support system more so in Europe than elsewhere. I've got mortgage rates, which are only 2% uh, in, in Europe, not 7% in the US. I can get fired tomorrow in the US. I've got some sort of 
job protection in Europe. And so if we do go into recession, it could be, and I don't have, I don't have um, most people owning guns. So, I mean, I know that sounds a bit extreme, but if you wanted to spend, you know, if, if the world hits a hard place, I don't know if I'd want to be in the U.S. And actually, speak to anybody who's traveled to the U.S. recently. They will tell you how expensive the U.S. is. Um, it's really, yeah, really expensive. I think, to be clear, we don't have a problem with American per se. So we look at American companies all the time. It's just a question of valuation. And that final point is crucial and is actually very beneficial to Japan. So Japanese people will have seen no wage inflation in like 20 years. So if you look at the unit cost of labor in Japan vis-a-vis -vis America, Japan is extremely well advantaged. That's a benefit. But that, the other thing is that point of we want management that are on our side. And unfortunately, when we look at many U.S. companies, managements are concerned about one thing and one thing only, and that's their pocketbook. They want to get rich. And management getting rich means less for shareholders. And this comes through Sean actually wrote, I think, a LinkedIn post about it a little while ago about these companies, often these companies buying back stock, buying back stock, using all the company's cash flow to buy back stock. But all that's actually doing is offsetting the dilution of share options to management. And so in those cases, basically all the economic value added is flowing to management. And that's not something for us. We, we, so, you know, we look, we look at Chile, we look at Brazil, we look at America. It's all the same for us. We're just looking for stocks that are undervalued with management on our side. So here's an interesting point, and I'm going to read, I haven't read the whole question here. The current government debt trajectory of most developed market economies seems to indicate that interest rates cannot rise much further or stay where they are for very long due to the interest expense on the debt eventually becoming unsustainable. In my opinion, the signal signals negative real interest rates for longer than might be consensus at the moment. Given this reality, do you foresee higher long-term interest rates in the US and DM to be feasible if an ever higher proportion of tax revenue uh, has to be used to service existing debt? I mean, that is a that is a real problem that the, I think it's a great question, and it's a real problem that the developed markets face. And look, I mean, we wouldn't want to be bond investors right now. And that's what we find attractive about many of the companies. And when we look at, at companies, a key factor is not just what's the debt to equity. You know, it's what is the debt, what currency is the debt in? Is it fixed? Is it floating? Are they vulnerable to um, these higher interest rates? I think the interesting thing, though, is a lot of people out there seem to me, you know, you look at what's going on in the US. It's, oh, well, the, the CPI did this, CPI beat. OK, great, let's go buy the tech companies, because if interest rates aren't going to rise anymore and tech companies do well when interest rates don't rise, well, we buy the tech companies and all the rest. And you can see how volatile it is. The problem they're missing is that operating income for those companies and revenue for those companies are falling. And so now you've got a very crowded space. You know, if we then take that problem that you highlight and put it into into markets, you've got a problem. You've got a, everybody's worrying about interest rates and trying to guess the next move. <coughs> but it speaks to why you want to be in um, solid companies with strong balance sheets. Andrew, did you want to add something there? If I make two points, and I, I agree with that question, and I think two things are slowly happening. One is people are realizing the king has no clothes. So if you look at the UK, they actually lost control of the long end of the curve. So even though short-term rates are very low, you get long ends selling off. And it comes to, and what happened in the UK, they realized there were actually no buyers of the bonds. So you, even though you cut rates and you print money, you lose kind of control of the long end. And the other thing you lose control of is inflation. So you could say, oh, they could just do more QE to actually buy all the debt and print more money. Well, that just res that does result in inflation. So I think you're right. I think there'll be negative real rates because they won't hike rates because A, they can't. <laughs> but controlling inflation is much harder. Um, you just get steadily inflation. In actual fact, you probably find secretly governments are very happy with inflation because it's the only way they can get rid of their debt is inflated away. So, yeah, you, you want companies that will real assets that will protect you in, from inflation. Whether those real assets are equities, property, we, we don't find value in property at the moment. But, yeah, so I, I think for sure you want to be cautious of, let's call it nominal assets. The obvious question then is, well, are you a gold bull? Personally, no. 
um, because I think they're better things to buy than gold. But um, yeah. And I think the other thing is, even if inflation does flatten or pull back, you know, bearing in mind we've got wage inflation, which is only really kicking in for the first time now on big numbers, um, will central bankers take rates back down to naught? And I think, you know, if you look at what's going on with the speculative frenzy and the money that's been lost in Bitcoin, um, I think I think central bankers would be very, very reticent to do that. So trying to guess inflation, to guess interest rates, to guess tech stocks is missing a trick, we think. You know, especially because just at the underlying level, the earnings of those companies are under pressure. Right, let's see. Um, oh, another question. What are our RAND projections? Well, look, you know, we, we, we don't really spend time forecasting currencies. I can't give you one. I have had some people in the past say, well, we want to take our money offshore, but we worry that the, it's not a good time because the RAND is weakened versus the dollar. Well, the one benefit of a, I mean, that might be relevant for a company where, you know, all the assets are in dollars, but for, um, oh, sorry, a fund, um, for a fund such as ours, we have a basket of currencies. So sterling, yen, and dollars and euros, et cetera. So perhaps, um, yeah. But I think in terms of specific brand, Andrew, yeah. Two comments on currencies. The one is we do take views when we think things become extreme. So when, for instance, the pound got down to 103, 104 a few months ago, it is like the lowest PPP purchasing power parity level in, I don't know, since 1982. And then we become more bullish on it. When, when things become dislocated, cheap or expensive, we take notice. On the RAND per se, I, I haven't looked at recently, even on a purchasing power parity basis, I don't think it's wildly out of whack. The one thing that does concern me about the RAND and SA economy in general is a lot of the issues have been papered over by the exceptionally high coal price. People do not realize that SA's biggest export is coal and the current coal price is $400 a ton. Normal price is probably closer to 90. If and when, and I'm sure it will revert back to normal when the energy crisis abates, um, that will not be good for SA's tax collection nor the balance of payments. So it is something to be aware of. Good, good. Thanks, Andrew. Good points there. Right, so we, we're drawing to the end of um, the end of the call. Any last questions? If you haven't asked a question or you want to get in touch directly, you know, please do so. We're going to be here all the way through the uh, the Christmas period, unfortunately. No traveling back to SA this Christmas for um, for me. But um, and and if you'd like us to do, if you know, if you if if you've got clients that you think would benefit, and you wanted to run through this presentation, wanted us to run through the presentation or speak to them directly, very happy, you know, um, to do that for for some of your larger clients. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be an interesting year. I'm just going to see if any more questions, and otherwise we'll. And further to that, even you know, direct <laughs> investors, personal investors, you're thinking about investing, ran more invested. We normal people and we're happy to chat to you at any time if, if you have any questions about our, our fund or anything like that. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. Good. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. I hope you found that useful. Um, we would welcome any feedback, good or bad, um, and, and let's keep in touch. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Keep well.